So my message title is going to be a convicted first degree worshiper. A convicted first degree worshiper. And we're going to read about uh, one such character in the Bible. 2 Samuel chapter 6 verse 12. And it was told King David saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. We know that we're blessed because of the ark and the presence and the power of God. That's what was told to David. So David, when he heard that, went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David. Notice how he did it. Not with sadness, not with madness, but the Bible says with gladness. And it was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, that he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all of his might. It is an order to dance before the Lord. Now, maybe your personality and your temperament doesn't make it feel like it's the kind of thing you could do, but it's the kind of thing that you can do in the presence of the Lord, and it's the kind of thing that is God blessed. And it is biblical that it happened. David danced before the Lord. The Bible says, chronicled by the person, the prophet that watched his life, it said he did it, not sissified, not dignified, but the Bible says with all of his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, notice Michael Saul's daughter, his wife, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And I was thinking during this worship service, this scripture kind of flashed through my mind, and I got to thinking she probably thought that he was so immature. <laughs> he was so foolish the way that he put on this display of dynamic worship. The Bible says that she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. Everybody say the tabernacle. tabernacle. Everybody say the tent. This is different than the temple, the tabernacle that David, this was David's desire. It was a short-term resting place for the ark of God. It was a tabernacle. It was a tent. David made the tent for the ark of God. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel as well, to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. Because every time you leave the presence of God, you leave with something more than what you came with. And he made sure that they left with a good piece of food, a piece of flesh, and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. And that's also what he did. And he went home to his wife. David, happy, had just exited a great worship experience. The Bible says he returned to bless his household, not knowing what had gone on behind the scenes with his wife. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, if you can allow me to read this with a little sarcasm, she said, oh, how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. And David said unto Michael, the blood kind of rushed up into his face and his hair stood on end, and he said, it was before the Lord which chose me before your dad and before all his house to appoint me ru ruler over the people of the Lord over Israel and notice how David described his display of worship unto God. He said, therefore, you think that's bad. He said, I am going to play. I'm going to play before the Lord. And if you think that's bad, you haven't seen anything yet because I will yet be more vile than thus. And listen to what, what worship really is. And will be base in my own sight because sometimes when I worship, I'm embarrassing myself and I realize I got to get outside of myself. 
So I'm going to even be based in my own eyes. I'm just going to even, I'm going to feel dumb sometimes, but it doesn't matter how I feel because I'm really trying to display how great God is and worship the Lord because of how good he's been to me. So there are going to be times when I worship David saying, I'm going to be based in my own sight. And he said, what's unique is you're laughing at me and you're jeering and you're mocking me, but the maidservants that you've talked about, of them I'm going to be had in honor because God's going to honor my life because I am a worshiper. 23 says, therefore Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. There's a lot of surmising that could go into there. She could have been smitten or stricken with barrenness or... I probably choose to believe, based on this passage of Scripture, that from that point forward, he didn't want anything to do with this woman. She was his wife. He had nothing to do with her. She had no children after that. Because basically, I think David said, I'm not going to be intimate with someone who makes fun of me for my love and my worship and my passion for God. This passage of Scripture we're going to spend some time with, Amos chapter 9 and 11 and also Acts 15 Interestingly, I was studying this passage of Scripture. I thought about these two other passages, not recognizing, but they truly are completely in tandem and connection with this passage of Scripture. Watch what it says. Because remember, we talked about the tabernacle and the tent, right? The tabernacle and the tent. Watch what Amos said. Amos said in 9-11, In that day will I raise up the tabernacle, not the temple, the tent, the tabernacle, the temporary dwelling place. The prophet said there's going to come a time that God is going to raise up the tent, not the temple, but the tent of David that has fallen. And he said, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as, as in the days of old. The prophet said, I'm going to build that tent that David built. In uh, Acts chapter 15, Simeon had declared, verse 14, how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree, the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. Why? That the residue, put your hand in the air and say, that means me. You're the residue. You know what the residue it's not like the main cake. It's like the crumbs that are left over. God's saying, I'm going to rebuild a system of worship so that all people, not just Jews, but that Gentiles, people that are residue, people that are the, the off-scouring of the world, he said, I'm going to set up a place of worship that everybody is going to be able to be involved with. Why? That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. I thank God for a Pentecostal church. I thank God where the tent of David has been restored in a Pentecostal church. And I came into a church like that in 1987 where something was restored that I had no idea anything about. And from an external observation, I thought everybody in that place, I maybe was like Michael until I, I found out better myself, I thought everybody in that place was crazy. Little did I know that in a short period of time, I was going to be with the crazies. This thing called worship is a beautiful thing. A convicted first degree worshiper. Why don't you turn around, shake three people's hands, and ask them, are you a worshiper? You can be seated. God bless you tonight. A convicted first degree worshiper. Now, there is a massive amount of biblical detail that is given as we walk through the page of Scripture. It's interesting that uh, there are certain elements of creation that so little time God spends with in the Scripture. 
He spends very little time, interestingly, talking about the building of the universes and the flora and the fauna and the, the world that we live in. Even the stars, it just says, and he made the stars also. He spends very little time, God does, concerning talking about the beauty of creation. And yet, interestingly, as you walk through the panorama of Scripture, when there are many, many verses that are given to a subject or to a person in the Bible, and yea, even going beyond verses, but chapters in the Bible that are dedicated to a certain individual, you've got to know this about that person. There is something that God is wanting to elevate in our attention, in our understanding about this person. Now, the person that we're talking about here tonight is, is a person that is not reserved just a couple of verses or even a couple of chapters, but a huge portion of the Old Testament is dedicated to the, to the study and the story and the history of the great man David. And not only to his life found in Samuel, uh, first and second, as well as in Chronicles, first and second, but also we have his writings, which in the middle of our Bible, uh, in the very middle of our Bible, and I don't think it's by happenstance or by accident, in the middle of our Bible is a song book called the Book of Psalms. And these are individual songs that have been written, the majority of them, some of them by Hezekiah, some of them by Moses, but the greatest majority of the Psalms were written by this man, David. So suffice it to say tonight that if you want to have a life that is pleasing to God, uh, one great thing, the Bible says that all the scriptures have been given for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come so that we can learn something from other people's lives. So when we look at David's life, there is much that we can extract out of his life because I don't know about you, but I want to please God in my life. And if I can, some people follow God and, and some people follow people that follow God. And I think at least in the formative stages of our walk with God, we learn how to follow people that follow God. Now, at some point, that's going to develop into a personal relationship that we have with God. But in many ways, we can walk in, in the footsteps of David and through observation learn very much from his life and very much about walking with God and what it means to please God. I think there's a, cer a certain few things that we need to discuss about David that... Um, is important that may qualify some of you that may feel unqualified tonight. I know a lot of people that don't feel qualified to be great or to have a tremendous walk with God because they say, well, you don't know where I've come from. You don't know the kind of background that I have. You don't know the sins that I've committed in my life. And yet, uh, I think it's important in studying the life of David that there is certain subjective uncertainty about his childhood. But if you allow me to surmise, I believe based on what Scripture has said, when he made the statement, I was born in sin and shapen in iniquity, he did not make an all-encompassing universal statement for all of humanity. He did not say that all of humanity was born in sin and shapen in iniquity. David said, I was born in sin and I was shapen in iniquity. Uh, we don't know what happened here. There are those that have uh, uh, posited their opinions and the potential of what could have been. There are some believe that he was born illegitimately. And as a result of that, when the prophet comes to anoint the next king of Israel and he asks Jesse to bring all of his sons, Jesse brings all of his boys, but the one son that he doesn't bring is the eighth forgotten son, the son that's operating the backside of a desert somewhere all by himself, the forgotten boy, the boy who also, when he desires to do something good and to step into the valley of Elah and to sl slay a giant who was impugning the nature of God as well as the people of Israel, that even his own brothers looked at him and said, who do you think you are? It's the naughtiness of your heart that's brought you here. So his father didn't believe in him. His brothers didn't believe in him. His brothers impugned his motives. They didn't understand him. And so he probably did not have the most perfect upbringing in his life. So can I tell you tonight that if you have not had the most perfect upbringing in your life, that you can still be something for God, that you can still accomplish something for God, and most importantly, you can still have a relationship with God in a way that you can be pleasing unto the Lord. Amen. Now, there may be people that don't believe in you. There may be a lot of people that, that, that uh, don't respect your life and all that. But the good news is you can be something for God and have a personal relationship with God. 
So his life and his childhood was not, was not a childhood, I would say, that was the most ideal. It was not the most perfect. Probably, realistically, he was very lonely through long periods of life. And if the truth be told, if you're going to be anything in God, you're going to go through seasons of tremendous loneliness in your life. Because eagles fly alone. That's just the way that it is. And, but through these times, God is in the process of developing not just the ministry, I find this interesting that there's a lot of people that are dialed into their ministry, and when the truth of the matter is, God is not just interested in our ministry, he is interested in the minister, because the ministry is the result of the minister. And quite often before he'll launch a great ministry, he'll work with the minister through in incredible times. We heard it this morning of trial and tribulation and loneliness and rejection and all kinds of personal issues in life. And we could say of David that David went through those kind of personal times in his life. But thank God we know the end of the story, that the end of the story was that he qualified himself to be used of God and to be blessed of God. And here we read through the pages of Scripture, his name comes up over and over and over again. There are a couple of primary characteristics of David I'd like to talk about tonight. Number one, David was a worker. Say he was a worker. I think it's a good thing to be a worker. If you're not a worker, you're a bum. And it's not good to be a bum. David applied himself, and interestingly, when no one else was uh, looking over his life, he did not have huge levels of accountability. How do we know that? Because he was out in the, uh, uh, the middle of a desert somewhere taking care of sheep, and his dad at least trusted him to take care of those sheep. And when no one else was there, he was corralling sheep. He was applying oil into the ears and into the eyes of the sick sheep. He had a good work ethic. He stayed at it. He trimmed the sheep when they needed to be trimmed. And he took them to the high mountain pastures. He walked them through the valleys. He made sure that they went by the, the water courses so that they could be watered. He made sure that they were well fed. He made sure that if there were diseases that moved through the sheep, that he cared enough to make sure that those those sheep were taken care of and the Bible even goes far enough to say that when a lion came to take one of David's sheep that David didn't just let that lion come and gobble up that sheep of his now I know we've got Sunday school teachers here today and I know we teach the nice cute little watercolor stories of David and he's a little cartoonish looking guy there and you know he's got the little staff and he's uh you know he looks like a little baby faced little boy and and you got the picture of the cute little lion you know what I mean the cute little lion have you ever seen a lion have you ever been to the zoo if you have never been to the zoo you owe it to yourself for Bible reasons to go visit a zoo and I, I, I've been in a zoo, and there was about maybe a half inch of plate glass between me and, and these wild animals, and, a, and there was, happened to be a lion in there, and that lion came up uh, up to that thick plate glass, and I mean, like to scare the fire out of me. This thing was, was, was rugged and vicious and a predator, and I thought, you know, we read the story, and the Bible says that David, when, when a lion came after his sheep, he went after that lion. To make it even worse, it wasn't just a lion. I've got a story at some point. I've got to dig it out somewhere. I was reading in Field and Stream about a guy that got attacked by a black bear. Now, I want to, I've never bear hunted. Some of you bear hunt. At some point, I may bear hunt, but uh, my desire for bear hunting decreased after I read this Field and Stream story of a guy that went bear hunting. Because in great detail, this bear attacked him in the middle of the night as he was walking out of the woods. And when it attacked him, it had his head within its jaws. And this thing mangled his eye. It was just a miracle that the guy even lived. And so the, the, the short of it is, I read the story and I thought, all I could think of was David, that David killed a bear. I, I have less of a desire to bear hunt than I've ever had. But here is someone, David was a dedicated, he was a dedicated worker. There's a lot to be said for being a good worker, and particularly a good worker for God. The Bible in Proverbs 13 and 4 says that the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Proverbs 12 and 24 says the hand of the diligent shall bear rule. So I would say tonight that being a worker is a good thing. So we could say of David's life long before his ascension to the throne, 
long before he becomes a leader of men, long before he becomes the promised one of God, long before prophecy overarches his life that one day Messiah is going to come out of his loins, long before all of that, David qualified himself to be blessed of God because he was a good worker. I would like to take some time tonight to commend all of the good men and all the good women in this church that are good workers. This church is filled with good workers, and I thank God for that. If you want to be blessed, you want to be a good worker. If you are a slothful, the Bible uses the word sluggard, a sloth, the Bible says you're going to have a lot of trouble in life. So there's something about being a good, a good worker. David was that. David was a good worker. But David wasn't only a good worker. David was a good warrior. He was a warrior. Now again, I'm working against maybe some of the perceptions that we have when we're young as to how David was and what David was. And we picture David getting the little slingshot, you know, and he's got the sling and it's accidental and he just, you know, accidentally. And I do believe that God helped him to win the victory against Goliath. But I also want you to understand something that David was not some little sissy boy that was playing like a 12 year old with a slingshot and a BB gun. But David was a warrior and David, while he was watching sheep, also had a sling that he was practicing with. And you may not recognize this today because we hunt with bow and arrows and rifles and all different kinds of instruments of war. But one instrument of war was a sling. And those that bore the sling would have the ability to choose the right stone and they would practice and they would practice and they would release that sling and that, that, that projectile for, for a warrior that used a sling would, would meet its intended mark. And so when we're talking about David, we're not talking about a little kid that accidentally went out in the Valley of Eli and accidentally just happened to pick the smooth stone and kind of tossed that stone and luck was with him or, you know, the anointing of God was with him. I do believe the anointing of God was with him, but God anointed his skill. <laughs> you don't want to step into the arena of a Goliath if you do not have a walk with God, a faith in God, and a polished skill. And I know that defies a lot of people's thinking because they just think it was good luck, it was God luck. But it was, it was a man that had polished his gifts. He had polished his gifts when no one was watching. He had practiced and he had practiced and he had practiced so that when his time came and he was called upon, he was ready for what God put in front of him at that moment. I know a lot of people in life that say someday I'm going to get ready when God calls me. I'm going to prepare when God calls me. I'm just going to someday I'm going to apply myself. If you're called to be a preacher, I know some people say someday I'll study. Someday I'll get in the word of God. And when somebody asks me to preach, that's when I'll, I guess I'll get to studying. If you wait until that moment, it's going to be too late. You've got to be preparing in the dark for what God calls you into your future so that when your moment of destiny comes, you are ready for what God puts in front of you. And that was King David. He was ready. He was a warrior. The sheep, the high-pitched whine as the roaring lion pulled it from the flock, and David went after the lion, and he killed the lion. When he said, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. David knew what it meant to have a rod and it meant to have a staff. He would use the staff to pick up those sheep when they were cast, and he would use the rod to discipline them when necessary. And he would also use the rod so that when an enemy came against his sheep, that he could fight against the sheep or fight against the predator and kill the predator because David wasn't a sissy. David was a warrior. David was a worker, and David was a warrior. But most importantly, more so than being a worker and more so than being a warrior, David was a worshiper. Clap your hands on the Lord. Let's give God some worship tonight. I have at least 100 Psalms in this Bible as an exhibit that David was a worshiper. We have example after example after example in the scripture that David was a worshiper. 
He was a worker, he was a warrior, but most importantly, he was a worshiper. The worker qualified him, the warrior qualified him, but God knows there's a lot of workers and a lot of warriors, but what he's really looking for is a worshiper. Amen. So when we read 2 Samuel or, or uh, 2 Samuel chapter 16 and we go through this passage of scripture, it's a pretty radical, radical display of David's worship. But I want you to recognize here tonight that, that 2 Samuel chapter number 6 was not a rare exception. Okay, when we read the, the, the sixth chapter of 2 Samuel, this was not an inconsistent behavior in David's life. This wasn't like, okay, you know, this is a big hubbub. This is a big deal. It's a single opportunity. It's, you know, I've never been here. This is a special time. It's the ark of God, so I'm going to dance. I'm going to worship. I've never done it before, but this is our big moment. This is Israel's big moment. And so, you know, on this big moment, I'm going to dance before the Lord. You need to trust me in reading hundreds and hundreds of verses of scripture that precede this that the moment that david worshiped in this way was preceded by a lifetime of private worship because public worship is always preceded by private worship as a matter of fact the best worshipers in public are the worshipers that are practicing in private to the person that knows how to shout and to sing and to dance uh, like the song says uh, when nobody's watching uh, then it's nothing when the people of God gather together and the song starts to play to get it out in the aisle and dance before the Lord uh, because it's not the first time that you've done it but you've got a lifestyle of worship that you have paved uh, in your relationship with God. It was not just an uncontrolled outburst. It was not like he just said, oh, I can't contain myself. But he had been living a lifestyle of worship. And so when the pinnacle of the greatest moment of his life came, which was to be in the presence of the ark of God and to be in the presence of the anointing of God, what did he do? He did what he had always done, and that was to worship his God. I want you to notice with me 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse number 13. So verse number 12 says that David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of God with gladness. How many want the anointing of God in our services? You want the presence of God to be here? I'm going to lay out for you, and we're going to walk through these scriptures here, what preempted and what preceded the ark. If we're not careful, we'll get a little spoiled on Pentecostal church because we have frequent encounters with the anointing of God. We really do. And visitors that come in for the first time, they sense it. And uh, sometimes we're a little oblivious to it because we're used to it. But I don't ever want to get to a place in living for God and doing this church thing that we can just have church with, without the anointing of God. The ark of God, if you think about the ark of God, the only thing I can think of is I go back and it's a poor example, but it's a visual example for me, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you remember that movie from way back when, Harrison Ford, and when they took the top off of that, which really was a biblical thing that took place, the men of Bethshemesh, they took the top off of the Ark of God. And when that happened, the Bible says that 50,000 people were killed that day because the Ark of God wasn't, it wasn't just some ho-hum little thing that you could just any old time you wanted to just go up to the Ark and play with the Ark and be in the presence, be in the anointing. But the fact of the matter of it was that it was the place where the unmitigated power powerful, concentrated presence of God. God said, I'm going to dwell between the cherubims on the mercy seat where the blood had been applied. That was, that was the ark of God. That was the physical location and address of the presence of Almighty God in all the earth. So if you look at the whole earth, God's attention was put upon Israel. And then not just Israel, it focused to a tent. And then it went beyond that tent to to the ark of God and from the ark of God it went to those two cherubims from the two cherubims where the blood was and the presence of God was posited and displayed in that ark of God so God so David here is excited about bringing the ark of God back into the city of David and verse number 13 says he did it the right way because if we're gonna have the ark of God in our midst it's not gonna come to an apathetic people it's not gonna come to a people that don't care 
And so David leads the way, and it says, It was so that when they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, that he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. So he went six paces. One, two, three, four, five, six. And they began to sacrifice. Now, we don't think a whole lot about that, but an oxen, an oxen was like a John Deere tractor. An oxen was a farm animal that did lots of work. It was a very expensive animal. A lot of people didn't have oxen. And so they're bringing in the ark of God, and, and David is like, we got to make sure that God knows how much we appreciate him. So we are going to go before the ark of God, and as we go before the ark of God, we are going to sacrifice because we want God to know how appreciative we are of his glory. So we're going to sacrifice. We're going to give God something that costs something, something that has value. And the Bible says they would sacrifice the oxen and the fatlings. Well, sometimes the truth be told, it's easy to give our money. Now, a lot of times it's not, but once you get that principle of giving in your life, once you get tithing, once you get it, it's not hard anymore. <laughs> It's true. Once you get it, you just do it. And after a while, you just live that way, and it's not, this is what I do. It belongs to the Lord. Sometimes you, you, you can give your money, but David realized, I've got to give something more than just something that costs physically. I, I, I've got to give something from myself. I've got to give something personal of myself. The Bible says that David danced before the Lord with all of his might. David danced before the Lord with all of his might. So if you can picture the scene in front of the Ark of the Covenant, they're sacrificing, they're killing these animals, and then David's following behind that, and he's dancing before the Lord. The Bible says with all of his might. He is worshiping with all of his might. And then the Bible says that all the house of Israel brought up the Ark of the Lord with shouting. Listen, we're not crazy to make a joyful noise unto the Lord when we come to the house of God. In fact, I'm going to challenge you here tonight to, to give, me, give me as many New Testament examples as you can of how we are to worship God. The truth be told, there's very, very few New Testament examples of worship. There are very few New Testament examples. They're not there. We have in the book of Colossians and in the book of Ephesians, the Bible says that we ought to sing before him with psalms, 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 psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord. So what are you saying, Pastor? Are you saying, Pastor, that we shouldn't have all this worship stuff? Are you saying, are you like the Church of Christ? Are you saying that there shouldn't be musical instruments and all that? No, I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is that the Word of God already had a song book in the middle of it. So when he said that when we come before his presence, we use psalms and hymns, the New Testament church was just saying, instead of rewriting the whole Old Testament about worship, all we've got to do, now I feel the Holy Ghost, is reach back and touch the book of Psalms. All we've got to do is reach back to our Messiah's father, who is David. All we've got to do is reach back to the ultimate example of worship, and I don't have to write a whole nother chapters, a hundred chapters, I don't have to write a whole nother book on worship, New Testament church, all you've got to do is reach back to David, and reach back to the Psalms, and reach back to the example that's given by David, and if you want to know what church looks like, all you got to do is look at David's life, because he was the author of the book of Psalms, he was the great worshiper, he was the one who, who was ultimately going to give birth to Messiah, and he is the one that is our example of worship. And New Testament church, if you want to know how to worship, all you've got to do is go into the Old Testament and look at how David worshiped, and that's what a Pentecostal church ought to look like. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's how church ought to look. That was the example. The Bible says shouting, the sound of the trumpet, Verse 16, David was leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she looks at him and sarcastically speaks about his life and just says, you know how glorious was the king of Israel today? And you've got to recognize that if you're going to be a genuine worshiper of God, there are going to be people that misunderstand you. 
You've got to understand tonight that there are going to be people. Interestingly, it hit me in the, our worship service today that she looked at him and said, you're so immature. Let me tell you what maturity is. Maturity is worshiping God recklessly. <sighs> it doesn't mean the longer that you serve God, the more you learn to sit back. Well, you know, I've been around for 30 years now. And uh, I've kind of got it down. And I've got this living for God thing down. I don't need to act like, I'm not a new convert anymore. I've been around for a little while now. If you want to know what maturity in God is, we look at David as our example. I thank God this church has great workers. We have many great workers in this church. I thank God for, for workers. We have warriors in this church. We have great warriors. You know what? You will defend the truth and you will fight for the truth. And I thank God for that. But do you know the premium thing that God looks for? He's looking for workers. He's looking for worship, for, for uh, warriors. But most importantly, he's looking for worshipers. Worshippers, worshippers, worshippers. It's not foolish to worship God. As a matter of fact, if we want the blessing of God, the ark of God, the anointing of God, it is preceded by great sacrifice and by great worship. By great worship. By great worship. Going to be people that don't understand it. It's okay. I learned a long time ago. I just, I don't worry. When guests are here, I don't worry about it anymore. I don't worry about it. As a matter of fact, what I would say is Pente Pentecost. When the guest comes, and I know you bring them, and, and you bring them, and you want it to be a safe service, and you want them to have a good experience, but you know the experience they're really looking for? They've been to enough dead churches. They've not been to enough ABC religions. They've been to enough places. Uh, they've been bored out of their mind. What they really need is an experience with God. What they really need is the experience. They need the experience, which means unfettered, unfiltered, genuine worship to God that brings the glory down. And when the glory comes down, the glory will do what religion can't do. The glory will do what we can't do. The glory of God will do what no human being can do. And the glory is a result of worship. Hallelujah. 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 Worship. I want to encourage worship. I want to encourage our young people to worship. I want to encourage our old people to worship. I want to encourage everybody to worship. Because near as I can see, there are three types of people. There are three types of people. Number one, there are those that are guilty by association. Guilty by association. The only thing they could be accused of is being at the scene of the crime. Well, I was there. What more do you want? I went to that Pentecostal service. I mean, I got my body to that worship service. Isn't that sufficient? That's guilt by association. And there are some that are guilty by association. I was there. I went to church. There are those that are guilty of worship in the second degree. What is being guilty of worship in the second degree? What that means was the music was just right. The atmosphere was just right. Everything was moving in the house. Everything was happening in the house. And they worshiped, but it was a crime of passion. They could not help themselves. Others cooked the meal and they ate it with tepid involvement. Some are thermometers. They can tell the temperature. And when someone else has cooked up a good meal of worship and someone else has put together hours and hours of prayer and someone else has worshiped their heart out and someone else has set the stage and God moved, then they are guilty of worship in the second degree. They participate. You can give them that, but it's inconsistent. If everything is right, they'll participate. If the music's just right, and if the sound is just right, and if the temperature is just right, and if the lights are just right, and if we have just the right size group of people in the house, and there's just enough of the worship of God and the presence of God that falls in the house, then they'll be guilty of worship in the second degree. But then there are those that are guilty of worship 
Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. In the first degree, they have motive, they have prior intent, and there are witnesses. I've seen these kind of people. He was a young man. He was about 11 years of age. He was in the church. His parents were, were godly people. They'd raise him to be a godly young man. And I, I don't recall all the details, but I'll tell them the best that I can. And he went in for an operation, and something went wrong in the operation. The operation, they, they clipped a nerve, and this young 11-year-old boy who had been very strong and like any, any young boy running around, active, uh, and they, they, they had made a mistake in the surgery. When he came out of surgery, part of his body was inoperable. They thought perhaps maybe, and they had prayed hard, maybe God will heal him, but God never did heal him. His right arm was inoperable, and if you were to talk to him today, he speaks with a slur, but his parents had raised him to live for God and love God. And when this took place, it's interesting that you're really going to know what you're made of when you're, you're put to the test. When life throws you its curveball, and what happens that we heard taught about this morning, you're thrown the tribulation in life, and you're thrown the greatest trial of your life, what you really are is going to come out. But this young man, though he lost operation of his arm, though he couldn't speak as well, when the presence of the Lord would get moving, he'd begin to beat on the pew in front of him. He couldn't necessarily clap his hands together, but he was not a, a he was a first degree worshiper, not a second degree or a third degree. He was someone that had motive and he had intent and was determined that I'm going to be a worshiper of God no matter what happens in my life. See, this young man was guilty of worship in the first degree. If you were at our, our family camp, we had a fabulous, fantastic family camp, one of the highlights of our family camp. Some people, I don't know if they enjoy it, but if they don't, they're really missing out on it. On a Saturday night, we have a bilingual service. Now, it's a little awkward because um, if you're white and you're English, you're going to hear songs sung that you never heard sung before. You're going to hear instruments pulled out that you, you didn't know that you could use a trumpet like that in church. And those people were blasting their trumpets and they were playing their salsa beat. And about 600 Hispanics, along with about 400 English, are worshiping God on a Saturday night. And I mean, they, they, they get going, man, and they get twirling and they get jumping and they get shouting and they get dancing and they get to magnifying the Lord. And there is a demonstration of, of faith that comes when the presence of God visits not just their deep worship, but their praise as they praise the Lord. God shows up in the place and miracles start to happen. In that Saturday night service, there were people that received the Holy Ghost for the first time as God responded to their worship. But what really caught my attention, standing on the platform, I looked, and there was a boy that had been in a wheelchair. He had been in a wheelchair. I, I don't know to what degree he had been affected by his condition, but I do know this. I know that he couldn't operate very well. He, couldn't, uh, he had very little control of his facilities. But, but when the worship began to flow, he was one of the first ones that would flop out of his wheelchair, and on his hands and knees, uh, he would crawl up to the front, and he would clap his hands, uh, and everybody else was shouting. And he'd spin on the floor, and he'd lift his hands, uh, and he had a lot less mobility than 98% of us in this building, but he was not a third degree worshiper. He was not a second degree worshiper. He was a first degree worshiper, and he'd made up his mind, uh, I'm going to worship my God. I'm going to worship my God. If anybody had all the reason in the world to say, hey, you know what? This is embarrassing. I should just keep still. I don't want to become, you know, the center of attraction. But he was a first degree worshiper, and he's a worshiper of God. I remember being in Stockton, California, a huge, huge sanctuary, seats about 2,500 people. I'd be up in the balcony, and the presence of the Lord would move in that, that powerful revival church, and I would look, and here would come out of the corner, coming around the corner, was an old man. He was probably in his late 80s or 90s, and he would come, and you could just see it. He, he, the best that he could, he would straighten himself up, and he would do this at about this speed. And man, when people watched him start to do that, that place would come unglued. Because, you know, Tim, he, he, he didn't have it in him to run at 5 or 10 miles an hour. Inside, I think he was doing laps. But all that he had that he could do was this. 
But that's what he did. Because he wasn't looking for an excuse to be a third degree. He was not looking for the atmosphere to be perfect. He was there because his God was good. His God was worthy of worship. And he gave God what he could because he was a first degree worshiper. He was a first degree worshiper. Some of you may remember Brother Taylor. I don't mean the Brother Taylor in Duluth. I mean the Brother Taylor... The lunatic that used to be in, yeah, in Bemidji, my good friend. As a new convert, the presence of the Lord start moving in our, our little converted school building there. God would start to move, and all of a sudden, Dwight taught me how to worship and how to pray. He really did, by example, because he knew how to get a hold of God. He knew how to pray. He knew how to worship God. The presence of God would begin to, to move in the house, and the only way I can explain it is like an Indian war whoop. Woo! I mean, he would let out a war cry. And you, I mean, I mean, them little doodads that go up and down your spine, they do that two or three times. Woo! And you'd feel the presence of God. And it, was, it wasn't like scripted. It was, you could tell the Holy Ghost had blown in. What are you saying? I'm saying we need those kind of worshipers. What God's looking for is those kind of worshipers. The Singaporean people, who was the missionary that was in Singapore, recently passed away a number of years ago. Uh, tremendous missionary. Willoughby, brother and sister Willoughby. Phenomenal, wonderful worshipers. Beautiful worshipers. Worship with reckless abandon. That church of Singaporeans, the name of their church was Tabernacle of Joy. And in Singapore, they had taught those people how to worship their God. And this is what they would say. The service would begin to get moving, and the pastor would get up, and this is what he would say. Mark my words. He would say this. He would say, the dance floor is open. The dance floor is open. And those Singaporeans would come out of the aisles and they'd come up around the front and they'd begin to worship and rejoice and praise the Lord. And you know what? God gave them great revival because God's looking for a church of worshipers, a group of people that haven't got over their relationship with God, a group of people that are still excited, that recognize they've been forgiven and they love God and they worship God with reckless abandon. And the presence of God meets them and blesses the house. Some of you remember Adam Berry. We need to pray for Adam. I, I got to thinking about this message here in worship and thinking about it, and I just thought, you know, we, Adam needs to be back because Adam was a worshiper. At, do you remember Adam? He would, he, I don't think he ever made it to this building, but in the old building, he'd get on the front of the building and he would, I, I can't even explain how he would do it, but he would do it in such a way until his face turned so beat red and the sweat would pour off of his face. And I called him our Pentecostal Pogo because he would be up and down, up and down, up and down, worshiping, worshiping, worshiping. I remember the testimony when he called me one day and said, Pastor, I got the Holy Ghost. I got the Holy Ghost. And he'd been seeking for the presence of God for a while. He said, Pastor, I got the Holy Ghost. I was painting. He was painting an apartment. And he said, I began to worship God. And you know what? I started feeling the Holy Ghost. And God filled me with the Holy Ghost. And I started speaking in tongues while I was painting the walls of this apartment. I'm telling you tonight that God is still interested in worshipers. We never get to a place as a church that we graduate past being a worshiper because what God's looking for is worshipers. He's saying I'm seeking after them that will worship me in spirit and in truth and if we are a people that worship God, we're going to be a people that experience the presence of Almighty God. I want you to know it's not just emotionalism. It makes God happy when we worship Him. Convicted means that you've been tried and found guilty of the crime. The good news is that worshiping isn't a crime. It's what God wants. Have you been found guilty of being a worshiper? In legal terms, murder in the first degree. In order for someone to be found guilty of first degree murder, the prosecution must prove that the person killed another person, the person killed the other person with malice afterthought, and the killing was premeditated. To kill with malice afterthought means to kill either deliberately and intentionally or recklessly with extreme disregard for human life. Premeditation means with planning or deliberation. 
The amount of time needed for premeditation of a killing depends on the person and the circumstances. It must be long enough after forming the intent to kill for the killer to have been fully conscious of the intent and to have considered the killing. Premeditation means planning or deliberation. So let me ask you a question here tonight. Could we convict David of being a first degree worshiper? Could we convict David of that? Could David be convicted of being a first degree worshiper based on those terms? He was convicted by at least two and I would say three people. David was, being, was convicted of being a first degree worshiper by his sarcastic wife. And you know what, it's okay. Sometimes we need to be made fun of for our love and our belief in God. It's going to cost us something if we live for Jesus. If we live for Jesus, there's going to be people that talk about this church. And it's okay. We don't have a complex about it. Do we? We don't have a complex about it. We're not going to freak out about it. We're not going to get angry about it. We're not going to get upset about it. Because the Bible says that people are going to speak evil of us for his name's sake. But man, if I'm going to be spoken evil, I've had people tell me, man, I'm being persecuted. And I thought, no, you're not being persecuted. You're just stupid. It's true. I've had people say, man, I went to work and all these people. No, they, they just went to work and they acted like a fool. They acted foolish. They treated people foolishly. They're obnoxious. And they blame that on persecution. That's not persecution when you treat people foolishly. Persecution is when you do the right thing, live the right way, and in spite of loving Jesus, are persecuted for doing all the right things in the right way. We need to put a smile on our face because the Bible says you ought to leap for joy when you're persecuted for his name's sake. David was convicted by a, as a first-degree worshiper by a sarcastic wife. There are going to be people that don't get our worship. I think one of the first things we got to do to be good worshipers is we've got to get over this, this idea in our own head. And I'll be the first to admit it. Of feeling uh, insecure or feeling the center of attention. David said, thus will I be more vile in my own sight, more base in my own sight. He said, you know what? I'm going to put myself to the side. Sometimes if you really want to get a touch from God, you got to put yourself to the side. Because first degree worshipers, they put the seven days that have preceded Sunday behind them. If I had a bad week, it has nothing to do with God. If I'm broke and can't pay my bills, it's not God's fault. If I've been persecuted, it's not God's fault. If, if things have not gone right in my life, it's not God's fault. And so the truth is, I can walk into the house of God maybe not feeling good. Maybe I've been sick all week. But I can walk into the house of God and say, The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endureth to all generations. It doesn't matter how my life's going when it comes to worshiping God. It doesn't matter how I feel when it comes to worshiping God. It it doesn't matter what other people think about my life. My bank account has no bearing on my worship of God. How many zeros are lack thereof? How many cellophane windowed envelopes I've got sitting on the fridge waiting for me when I get home does not matter. The difficulty in my marriage has nothing to do with how good my God is or how good he isn't. <laughs> Amen. I, if, if, our, if my ministry is not going right, it has no bearing on my worship of God because the Lord is good and his mercy is everlasting and I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. I will bless the Lord. I may not feel like it. I may be going through the worst day in my life, but I can still stand to my feet and give God something worthy because I am a worshiper. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. I want you as a church to know 
Listen, we've got service orders. We have service orders. We, we try to be organized. We practice. You, you need to know our musicians, I thank God for them. They practice. They put time into this. And I think we should because our God deserves that. Your preacher, you need to know, I study, I pray, I fast because I, I believe God expects that out of me. I believe God expects me to prepare and to do the best I can. But you know, my, my picture of a perfect service is we have our service order. I got my prepared message. I pray and I've sought God. My idea of a perfect service is when God blows that to smithereens. <laughs> Hallelujah. I would love services to start like they have them in Ethiopia, that the people come walking in the back doors of the church. The choir comes walking in the back doors of the church. Not the choir here, but the congregation has a choir. And the service before it ever begins, hands are in the air. Hands are being clapped. Hearts are being lifted. Praise is going forth. Worship is being lifted. You want to see the greatest services River of Life and Grand Rapids has ever had? It's going to be when the worship Worshippers step forward, and the worshipers in a first degree way say, I'm gonna bless the Lord at all times. <laughs> hallelujah! 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 Oh, bless the Lord! Oh, bless the Lord! Bless the Lord! Stand together with me tonight. So what's the best part of the service, Pastor? The best part of the service is when God shows up. What's the best part of the service? When God manifests his glory. That's the best part of the service. The best part of the service is when God stretches out his strong right arm. Hallelujah and moves in a mighty way. That's the best part of the service. I'm going to close with this. Very simply, the tabernacle of David, the tent of David. Peter mentions it in Acts 15. The tent of David. What was that? He said that all the Gentiles might seek after the Lord. That's you and that's me. The Gentiles. Why was that? Because the temple was a restricted place. It had walls. It had full walls. It had half walls. It had different stations that had signs on it. If you were a woman, there were certain places you could not go in the temple. It would say, no women past this point. Only the men can go to this point. If you were a man, there were certain places that you could go. And then it would say, past this point, only the priests can go. And then there were signs that were a far, far away from the ark of God and the holiest of holies in the temple. And those signs said, all Gentiles, you can go no further than this. You can't go past this point. The Bible says in Acts 15, it said through the prophet Amos, the, the prophet Amos said that God said that he was going to rebuild the tent, the tabernacle of David. What was the tabernacle of David? The tabernacle of David was an open air tent. It didn't have walls. It didn't have restrictions. It didn't say, women, you can only go this far. Guys, you can only go this far if you're not a priest. Gentiles, you can't go this far. It was an open air tent that gave free access to the presence of God. There were choirs that were singing there. David organized them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There were choirs that were singing. There were recorders that were there. They were recording. I can only imagine what they were recording. They must have been recording the worship of the worshipers. And when David would say things like this, my tongue is the pen of a ready writer. What did that mean? That meant because he went into the presence of God. You know when the inspiration of the Holy Ghost comes on you? Dave would say, my tongue is like the pen of a ready writer. When I get in the anointing of the Holy Ghost, things start flowing. I start writing things about God. And there were recorders that were at the tent of David. There were trumpeters at the tent of David. 
What was the tent of David? It was a, a reinstitution of an Old Testament model of an openness to worship that every person could have access to. Oh, I feel God here tonight. And what Peter was saying is that in the New Testament church, the tent and the tabernacle of David has been restored. So when you walk into a Pentecostal church, it's like walking into David's Old Testament tent where there was singing and there was shouting and there was dancing and there was exuberance and there was sacrifice and there was prophetic words and there was anointing and there was miracles and there was signs and there was wonders and there was the presence of God and there was the worship of the one true living God. What do you say we as the church restore the tabernacle of David.